10 seconds. Guidance is internal. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. Space nuts. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Space nuts. Astronauts report it feels good. Hello again, and thank you for joining us on yet another episode of the podcast we call Space Nuts. I'm your host, Andrew Dunkley, and with me, the expert in everything above your head is uh, Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large. <laughs> Hello, Fred. Hey, that's a nice... I uh, oh, quite, quite like that, everything above your head, especially <laughs> given that top of my head's fairly empty. <laughs> well, it has multiple meanings. It could, mean, yeah. it could mean space, it could mean astronomy, it could mean hair. It could... Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it could yeah. mean could yeah. mean everything that we don't understand. So I like that. I might use it that. again one day. Mm. <laughs> and how are you, sir? I'm very well, thank you. Very well. Oh, Already raring to go and um, very glad to be talking to you again. I got a lovely note from a new listener. She's listened to two or three of our podcasts so far. I said, oh, you've only got 172 to go. And she said, I better do some catching up. But uh, she wrote a lovely email uh, and asked a question that's not um, related to actually going into the podcast. It was more of a um, an academic question, which mm -hmm. I've passed on to you. But uh, she was thrilled to bits to get a personal response, which um, is, that's the way I do it. That's the way I swing. I like yeah. to answer everybody when I can. Um, hey. and, and I told her you'd be hearing from her. Yes. Or she'll be um, hearing from you even. She, she, she will. <laughs> <laughs> At some stage. You're a very busy man. I don't dump on you too much, but no, no, that's all right. No, I, no, it, it will happen. Yes, that's all right. from time to time. Now, we've got uh, some really interesting stories to uh, discuss today, and we'll tackle a question. Uh, there's new uh, a new theory surrounding the mystical Planet Nine. We've spoken about Planet Nine oh, two or three times uh, because they're still looking for it, but now they've come up with a new idea, which uh, is quite uh, interesting indeed, um, captivating even. Uh, we are also going to uh, talk about the discovery of a galaxy cluster far, far, far away, I think was the headline. Uh, in fact, um, I think it's set a world record for the most mm. distantly observed object or something to that effect. So we'll check that out. And uh, we talked last week about Australia uh, gifting NASA some, um, some Mueller, $2.50, I think it was, after GST was taken out. Um, there's also um, further uh, consideration to Australia's expertise in the mining and medical industries that could help NASA with their next mission to the moon. So we'll, uh, we'll have a look at that as well. So first up, Fred, the, um, the hypothetical Planet Nine, they, uh, they have a new idea. Uh, that it's not a planet at all. Yeah. Um, there is a new paper which suggests that this object might actually not be a planet, but be something called a primordial black hole. Uh, and primordial black holes are th thought to be, to have been basically a consequence of the Big Bang. Um, they're something that's been in the theory for a long time. We don't really have any observations that support their existence, uh, but they are thought to have popped into existence more or less in the aftermath of the Big Bang uh, as a result of density fluctuations uh, at that early period in the universe's history. Now, um, as you know from the work that Stephen Hawking did in the 1970s, the black holes evaporate. They lose their energy, they lose their mass through radiation. And uh, they take a very, very long time to do that. But these primordial black holes are thought to be very small. And uh, they evaporate quickly. And it's thought that perhaps many of them have already evaporated. But some of them might still exist, even though, as I just said, they've never been observed. Now, the, the so the Returning to the story of Planet Nine, uh, this object has been surmised by the alignments in the orbits of actually what are called extreme trans-Neptunian objects, things way, way beyond the orbit of Neptune, which are in highly elliptical or elongated orbits. And 
they are basically aligned uh, rather well um, in, in a particular direction, the alignment of their elliptical orbits. And that's the main reason why people think that there is a, an extra, an additional planet out there that's basically providing the attractive force that's doing that. So, With through, a mass, so through their observations and through the mathematics that something is out there affecting these yeah. and, Neptune, and it's something, Neptune objects. That's right. And it's something with a mass between half and 20 times the mass of the Earth. That's the, the current, basically the current theory. Now, um, the I guess the, you know, perhaps one view of what that might be is a free floating planet that's been captured by the solar system. In other words, the gravity of the sun's grabbed onto this thing. Yeah. Uh, and there you've got planet nine. Uh, so what... Uh, the authors of this particular new research have looked at is the likelihood of that capture scenario compared with the solar system capturing one of these primordial black holes that might be lurking around. It turns out to be about the same. Ah. So uh, what, it's, what it means is that, um, you know, if it could be a free-floating planet, mm -hmm. yes, it could but it could also equally well be a, a, a black hole. Um, now, this is a black hole, say, around the five times the mass of the Earth. It would have, uh, I love this bit, it would have an event horizon uh, around about 10 centimetres in diameter. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, we think of uh, things in astronomy as enormous, and so when yeah. you say something like that, it kind of goes... What? <laughs> yeah, I think if I remember rightly, the um, the event horizon diameter, I think it's the diameter for the Earth is about 18 millimetres. I, I, I wrote about that in uh, Cosmic Chronicles, but um, I, I don't have a copy, so I can't. <laughs> That's because you the sold way. them all, Fred. It's, they yeah, they're like all That's right. I don't even have one for myself at the moment, so I can't look it up. Uh, of course, I could look it up because I've still got all the, the, the files. But, yeah, so um, anyway, it's a few, basically a few centimetres that we're talking about for the size of a, a sort of earthish sized uh, primordial black hole. So how do you find it? Well, what the proposal is from the authors of this paper is to look for uh, the annihilation signal from the dark matter micro halo around the primordial black hole. Okay. Uh, we don't really know what dark matter is, but it could be that dark matter and anti-dark matter annihilates and would give a signal that might be present in X-rays and gamma rays. So what they're suggesting is that uh, there should be dedicated searches for moving sources, basically, with uh, X and gamma ray radiation. Um, that's a really interesting thing, because the gamma ray sources that we see in the sky and the X-ray sources, well, gamma ray sources are very brief, so you don't see them moving at all. But the X-ray sources, of course, are all things at great distances, which are not um, moving uh, across the sky at all because they're so far away or not seem to be moving. Um, but if you've got an object that is moving slowly through the stars of the Milky Way, which is where we think hypothesized planet nine is, uh, and it's rich in X-rays, then maybe this is the answer, that you're seeing the annihilation of the micro halo around a primordial black hole. So up until now, we've been looking for a solid object. We've been looking yeah, for right. a planet, and it's yep. proven elusive. We also know how very hard it is to observe a black hole, yep. and we've only recently photographed one for the first time in history, and that's been published. So where does a primordial black hole fit in the scheme of things in terms of being able to observe it? You said we think they exist, we've never seen it, we can't prove it yet. So could this kill two birds with one stone? We observe yep. a primordial black hole and solve the planet nine riddle. Yeah, that's right. So for the first time it would observe, we'd observe a primordial black hole. So exactly that, killing two birds with one stone. I like it. Yeah. Well, um, obviously there's a lot of work going into trying to find this thing because it's um, it's close to home for us. We, um, we, On our doorstep. Yeah, we really need to see what's out there. If, uh, if that was discovered, 
you know, the first thing that would happen would be people would be thinking about sending a space mission. I was about to ask that very question. It would take a long time, wouldn't it? It would take a while, yes, because it's a long, long way out. But it's still a lot nearer than the nearest star other than the sun. Yeah, well, we've already proven we can send things vast distances. And with today's technology, uh, getting... um, Getting there and and the instrumentation required to do recordings and readings would uh, would be uh, fairly uh, fairly simple compared to you know the seventies. Uh, so that in itself is a is a bonus. Um, but yeah, we've got to find the darn thing first. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, interesting new theory on uh, Planet Nine. It could be could be a primordial black hole. You're listening to Space Nuts. Andrew Dunkley here and Fred Watson there. Three, two, one. Space Nuts. Now, I just want to remind people about our YouTube channel, and we're building up quite a little audience on YouTube. If you're a YouTube subscriber, maybe you'd like to subscribe to the Space Nuts podcast via YouTube. They've even got a play all button, Fred, which means that you can just hit play and listen to all 173 episodes (laughs) nonstop. I reckon that's pretty cool. Uh, we're aiming to get a thousand subscribers. We're up to three hundred and thirty-five as of this moment, which is fantastic. But if you would like to subscribe to our YouTube channel, it won't cost you a brass razoo. Uh, YouTube.com slash c slash space nuts, and yeah, go for it. You don't have to, but if you want to, it's there for you to peruse, or actually, you get to listen to it as well. Now, Fred, uh, let's talk about this. Um, this idea of using Australian technology to help NASA with their next mission to the moon. We're talking about mining technology and medical technology in a remote sense, because let's face it, when we go to the moon or wherever, you can't sort of um, break your leg and then go to hospital, or you can't sort of, you know, get someone to um, to drive your truck for you. Um, there, there's all sorts of um, things to consider with these remote um, places. I, I mean, we went to the moon in the 60s and the 70s, but looking back, we probably did it in a pretty um, um, radical way. I'll, I'll put it in those terms compared to the well, safety. Was, yeah. So it, compared to the safety terms of today. That's right. Mm. <laughs> It's very high risk, and we're much more risk averse these days. So this, yeah, this story is it covers many bases actually, but it's all about really the the fact that we now have a, a you know fairly close relationship between uh, Australia and the United States in their space agencies, thanks to the announcement by our Prime Minister Scott Morrison uh, a couple of weeks ago that Australia will contribute 150 million dollars to the U.S. Um, mission uh, aimed at sending uh, humans to, Mar- to Mars via the moon or to, to the moon and then on to Mars. And um, we, we know that most of that money is expected to return to the Australian economy because it will be all about um, Australian technology being used. And uh, just to, to comment briefly, that's exactly the kind of thing that uh, we're good at is making autonomous vehicles uh, that can actually do their own thing and think about it and be safe as well. Uh, they're used very much in the mining industry, um, the, particularly in the um, in the Pilbara region of Western Australia. Uh, that they have driverless haulage trucks, which are actually run from uh, the city of Perth, which is <laughs> about a thousand miles away, sixteen hundred yeah. kilometres. So um, that is technology that's fairly well developed in Australia and may well have an application uh, to, uh, you know, the, the exploration of. Uh, perhaps uh, the the moon, where maybe ice mining could take place near the South Pole region. I should um, I should point out too; these are not small trucks. They're not. No, they're these have got tires that tower over a tall man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, in fact, probably two tall men. Yeah, yeah they're, they're, they're you, pretty you amazing. Need a, you need a big ladder to get into the driver's cabin. One of mm. these things. Maybe that's why they don't have drivers. Uh, so yes, the, there's. All sorts of contributions that this kind of technology could make, and you're quite right; it it, it does have implications for 
uh, any kind of medical emergencies and things of that sort as well. Yeah, um, so there'll be a lot of work to be done into the future on that. But um, yeah. yeah, I can, and I would imagine that the you know the capacity to drive a remote vehicle on the moon from Earth wouldn't be that difficult because I, I think you'd, you'd almost have real time control compared to Mars. Yeah, that's right. Although it still would need to have a degree of autonomy so that uh, it didn't really, you know, um, accidentally drop into a big hole before the before the signals got back to Earth to say, I'm dropping into a big hole. Yes, ground-tracking so, radar or something like that. Yeah, mm. there, 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 there will be technologies, I'm sure. All right, watch this space. Uh, now, Fred, let's just move straight on to our next story, and this is the world record discovery of a um, um, distant galaxy cluster. So distant, in fact, we're looking back 13.8 billion years or thereabouts. Uh, so we haven't looked any further than this ever before. It's about 13 billion light years away, I think, is the um, that's that's correct. Is the, is the distance we're talking about, which is only a f- you know a fraction short of the the time of the Big Bang. So we are really looking way, way, way back in time. Yes, uh, exactly. So you're looking back to a time when the universe was 800 million years old, uh, which is round about six percent of its age at the present time. Um, so uh, it's a, a long way back. Uh, and, of course, the key to this is the finite speed of light. So what we're doing is looking at very, very distant objects and seeing them as they were at this time in the past. Um, wh- why is it a big story? Because this is the, f- the earliest that we've seen a cluster of galaxies. Individual galaxies have been found already at this very early period in the universe. Um, But uh, to find a cluster essentially tells you a little bit more about the way the the structure of the universe evolved. And it it shows that galaxy clusters were there at this very early time uh, in the universe. Um, The the thinking is, uh, as you and I have spoken about before, is that the, the the web of dark matter that filled the early universe basically acted, and it was a web in this almost in this uh, with resembling a kind of honeycomb, I suppose, a three-dimensional honeycomb of dark matter, which acted as the seeds for the locations of galaxies because the dark matter attracted the hydrogen that was in the universe, which collapsed and formed stars and galaxies, and so um, maybe. Um, in, in some ways, it's not surprising because we think that web of dark matter came very early in the history of the universe. Uh, and so to find the fact that galaxies themselves are congregating around the, uh, you know, the, the center, the high density centers of dark matter um, is is. Uh, what you'd expect. You'd expect to find clusters of galaxies, and this basically proves that that is the case. It has um, a very, very nice name. It is called Z660D. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) Mm. um, It's got a... There is a, a... a, a giant galaxy within it. This is often the case with clusters of galaxies. You find uh, a, a giant galaxy near the centre, and this one basically also has a giant galaxy, which is known by a rather nice name. It's Himiko, uh, which is a mythological queen of ancient Japan, because uh, this has been this study has been done by Japanese astronomers. Um, so that uh, that. Um, you know, giant galaxy uh, is one that you'd expect to be sitting near the centre of this cluster of galaxies because that's the way we see these objects in the universe today. When you see uh, a a cluster of galaxies in today's universe, the the, the big galaxy, the kind of nucleus galaxy, is right in the middle. But Himiko isn't. It's uh, quite a long way from the centre of this baby cluster perhaps 500 million light years from the centre, which is Mm. kind of nowhere near really, isn't it? Yeah, but it is part of the cluster. And I understand that the way they were able to determine its distance was uh, through something we talked about last week in in response to a question about blue shift. They were able to read the red shift. Was that right? Yeah, that's right. That's how you determine these big distances. You look for the way the light is shifted to the red because the the further it's travelled or the longer it has travelled through space, the 
further its light is shifted to the red by the expansion of the universe. Mm. Dumb question from no one in particular, uh, but uh, is our galaxy part of a galaxy cluster? Yeah, it's part of, well, something called the local group, uh, which is a small cluster of galaxies, but there is a, um, we're on the edge of um, of a bigger cluster. I can't remember which one it is. It's either Virgo or Coma. That's terrible, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> it's jet lag, know. Fred. I, think I don't know where we are. I'm still jet lagged. Lagged. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> who am I again? I don't yes. know. Um, who am I? What are you? <laughs> where did we come from? Well, that's what Fred is trying to figure out. But uh, yeah, fascinating that they've discovered uh, an object or a, a galaxy cluster further away than anything else has ever been observed in real terms. And it has set a world record for the most distantly observed object, as far as I'm aware. It seems a bit contradictory to say it's a world record, and yet it's something that's further away than anything we've ever seen before. So how could it be a world record? It's a universal record. It's an out-of-this-world record. It is indeed, yes. You are listening to the Space Nuts podcast, episode 173. My name's Andrew Dunkley, and with me, of course, Professor Fred Watson. Zero G, and I feel fine. Space Nuts. Another big shout out to our supporters via Patreon.com. We are building numbers there, which is fantastic. If you would like to contribute to the Space Nuts podcast, you can do so at patreon.com slash space nuts. Pop along and have a look. If it's not for you, that's fine, but maybe maybe it is. And, uh, you know, it's totally your call. Uh, it is patreon.com slash space nuts if you would like to be a uh, supporter of the Space Nuts podcast. Now, Fred, a uh, question. We're in, only going to fit one in today because we're doing a bit of cramming because you've, um, you've got to go and sell a book. Now, uh, <laughs> dear esteemed Professor Watson and Andrew, thank you for your, uh, your previous on-air reply. I have another question, if you would be so kind. Uh, yes, that is the question, Fred. By the way, we're finished. <laughs> uh, he says, this is from Wes Smith in Panama City, uh, in Panama City Beach in Florida. Oh, what a horrible place. Uh, if fuel could be mined from the moon for a Mars mission launch from lunar orbit with consideration of all planetary alignments, would there be any economy in using the Earth for a gravitational assist to help speed that transit? That is a really interesting question. We've talked about mining on the moon and, and the fact that we could go uh, go there lightweight because we could produce fuel from the um, the water ice that's there to, to make a return journey. But what if we sort of went, hang on a minute, we're already out of Earth's orbit uh, or out of Earth's gravitational field. Um, why not just Keep going. We'll, we'll get all our fuel on the moon and pew, off to the off to Mars. So that's pretty well what would happen. What you've just described. Andrew. Okay. Thanks for um, your question, Wes. You're uh, you're you're leaving. <laughs> you're leaving. You know, if you're getting stuff off the moon, then you you'd haul your your uh, fuel up to low moon orbit. Um, that means you've got to get a spacecraft. Uh, essentially in orbit around the moon from Earth. That's fairly straightforward. Then you've got to boost it, though, to the right velocity to get it out to the orbit of Mars. And doing that from the moon is not actually that much different from doing it from Earth. You could, depending on what time of the month you do it, you could give yourself an extra one kilometre per second or a free one kilometre per second from the moon's orbital motion around the Earth. But it's not vastly different. Um, So... The the only thing is, you, you know, thinking about, all right, so you're there, you're leaving the moon. Um, would you use the Earth for a gravitational assist? It, it's, it, it's possible. Um, if you were really stuffed for fuel, you know, if you, were, if you needed to economize on fuel, and perhaps one reason why you might want to do that is if you've got a very large spacecraft that's very fuel hungry, then yes, maybe you could put the your vehicle in an orbit that would um, actually not get to Mars, but come back and intersect with the orbit of the Earth, get a gravitational assist from the Earth, and then be boosted out to the orbit of Mars. But all that demands a lot of very careful alignment of the Earth and Mars. Mm. You might find you, you could only do that once every 10 years or something like that, that you wouldn't have a, many opportunities. And so I think what's much more likely to happen is, yes, you might well fuel up in lunar orbit, but then it will be a direct uh, path 
and by what's called a Hohmann transfer ellipse uh, from the orbit of the Earth Moon system at, directly out to the orbit of Mars without bothering to try and make a gravitational assist. I think it would it would be a very difficult thing to achieve. It's part, it's certainly possible, but I think in reality we'd wind up just going there directly. Yeah, uh, of course. The other thing to consider is you'd also have to produce enough fuel. Uh, to get all the way there, uh, would we be in a position where we would have to consider enough fuel to get back just in case we couldn't make it on Mars uh, like we didn't like we could on the moon let's assume we've we've got that technology and we've we've started doing that. The first trip to Mars would have to double the fuel load surely to to get back well yeah, that's right, although you could you know you could send a a robotic spacecraft to to basically rendezvous with Mars, sit in Mars orbit or something like that. Oh, I've already fueled up. Yeah, my guess, you know, Andrew, I've said this before, is I bet the first uh, human flight to Mars actually doesn't land on Mars, but lands on Deimos, one of ah. Mars' satellites. Why do you think that? Because it's a low-gravity destination. You, you have much lower risk of getting stuck on the surface if you're in a low-gravity environment like that. You can leave Deimos uh, with a Toyota Corolla. You don't need a spacecraft. The escape, <laughs> velocity, is, the escape velocity is 40 kilometres an hour. Is that all? Yeah, it's about you 28 get, you, miles an you hour. You can actually get off with a decent push bike. Yeah, a push bike could do it as when well. I, when I was a kid, that's the fastest I ever got a bike up to, 40 kilometres an hour. Yeah, that's pretty good going. Yeah, it God. was downhill with a tailwind. I bet it was, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I had a speedo on my bike. I could, I, I could have probably gone faster, except it was one of those old speedos that leans against the tyre, and they <laughs> took a lot of effort to wind up, so I'm pretty yeah. sure it knocked off at least 5Ks. Probably, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But um, yeah, that, Those were the days. Yes, yes. But it sounds like you could get off Deimos with a push bike. Yes, with a bit of luck. That's a bit of a worry, really, when it was, you yes. think about it. Yeah. Uh, but wouldn't it be disappointing to land on Deimos and go, oh, we're so close, we're so close? Yeah, I, uh, yeah. well, we, who knows? Let's, let's wait and see. Yeah. And uh, we'll cover it on Space Nuts in 2035 when it happens. Yes, indeed, <laughs> assuming there are no delays. Mm. <laughs> All right. Uh, Wes, thank you so much for your question. Hope that uh, covered it. And uh, we certainly um, do love to get your questions and queries and, and comments. Sometimes people just send us their, their beautiful space pictures, which is fantastic. And I, I've seen a lot of them, Fred, popping up on the Space Nuts podcast group, people um, sharing their photographs. And uh, there's uh, been some amazing photography. Uh, one of our listeners is already a major prize winner and is, so uh, is going after another prize. So hopefully people are voting for him on the People's Choice Award there. Uh, uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, join the group and have a look. Um, and thank you, as always, Fred, for your contribution. I don't think we could do it without you. Oh, that's very nice to hear, Andrew. Um, <laughs> I don't think I could do it without you either. So oh, there I'm you go. Sure you could. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, we'll speak next time. It sounds great. All right. Very good. Thank you, Fred. Uh, Professor Fred Watson, astronomer at large, uh, part of the Space Nuts crew, as you are too. And thank you for joining us each and every week. We will be back again in a week or so with another edition of Space Nuts. Space Nuts. You've been listening to the Space Nuts podcast. <laughs> Subscribe to the full podcast on iTunes and Stitcher or your favourite podcast distributor. This has been another quality podcast production from Fights.com.